My name is Cameron Buckner, and this is the What If It's True podcast, where we tell stories about strange events in people's lives. Stories written by the actual people that the event happened to. They're all fascinating stories that draw you in. They're all short in format. This is volume four of the best of Dixie Cryptid, another podcast that I do on YouTube. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave us a review, a thumbs up, whatever feature is on your podcast app, or share us on social media and tell people, hey, this is a pretty cool podcast. It really helps the podcast out. So thank you for joining us, and I hope you enjoy this podcast. I had a very interesting warm experience. On Father's Day in 1998, we took a drive up to Lake Tahoe. I had my dog, he's a blue healer named Chop. I was there with my husband and children, but I was drawn into the woods alone. I had never been in the woods before and I was extremely excited. I grew up in South Texas and if you look at a map of Texas, you see the tip at the bottom That's where I grew up. The only trees we had were palm trees, and I had certainly never seen a mountain or a forest before, as we had just moved up there from Texas. My husband told me to watch out for mountain lions. He said one could skin me in under five seconds, but I've never really been one to be afraid of wildlife or anything. I trust God to lead me always. I did not even have a compass, but I now, in retrospect, I don't think I needed one. All I knew is that I could hear the woods literally singing to me, calling to me in my heart. My father had died when I was nine years old, so Father's Day had always been like a holy day to me, and I had a song in my heart of pure gratitude. I told my husband I would be right back. I said that I had to go sing a song in the woods to my daddy in heaven. From the moment I stepped into the trees, I heard the sound of rushing water, but I never found any water. My dog Chop, who usually runs and explores, stayed right by my side and was silent and careful. I just thought he understood the solemnness of the moment. I must have walked for a half an hour following the sound of what I was convinced was going to be a beautiful waterfall, but the forest just got deeper and more dense. I remember looking up and only seeing tiny patches of blue sky, and that's how thick the forest was. I want to say here that I was never, ever afraid. Fear never entered my mind. I kept my lighthearted, sentimental feeling and pushed on unafraid, convinced in my mind that the waterfall must be right around the next tree or over the next little ridge. I can still hear the rushing water, but I'm growing tired. The forest then opened up as I came into a beautiful clearing with an old, dead, must have been three foot round tree trunk laying down on the ground. Before I even got out of the car, I could feel eyes watching me, as if the entire woods had eyes, but it didn't scare me. They felt like pure love. In fact, the feeling was calling to me and whispering to my heart in ways that I can't explain. It was a knowing that I had to get into the forest. I assumed it was the Holy Spirit as I am extremely in love with Jesus. I felt safe, but I knew I was completely lost. I did not know which way was which, and it was very strange that panic never came over me, even though the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I was confident that I was surrounded by eyes, but I was never afraid. I lay down on the log, and I began to sing to my daddy in heaven, and my voice seemed to echo from the trees, as the acoustics in the fine theater house and all the angels of heaven seemed to me to be listening, but it was just them, the ancient ones, watching over me. I realized that now. I felt as if my father could hear my song, and I never stopped feeling as if I were being watched by someone who actually cared for me or, at the very least, liked me, probably because of my skipping through the forest like a two-year-old with my dog. I did then hear a branch snapping, and I thought, well, I better get on out of here, and the same spirit that had led me in led me right back out. And even though I was lost, it was very gentle, and I just followed what I can only describe as ESP signals as to which way to go. 
My husband was surprised because he knows I get lost in a closet and he was distraught with our two tiny children and he was ready to call 911. Back then, I didn't know anything about anything, but now after years of research, we know who these things are. The guardians of the forest, they were here before us and they will be here long after us or perhaps they will be the first in line to get into heaven. Who knows? All I know is that they were angels to me that day. Blessings to you, sir, and you are free to use my name should you choose to recite my simple but honest true story. May God bless you and keep you. May he make his angels to stand guard around you, to protect you, to guide you, to guard you and prepare your way every day. And may all glory be to the Most High. Amen. Here's a story that uh, I don't think I've ever heard anything like this. Uh, You'll have to listen to the end to know what I'm talking about. But this is fascinating. And uh, let's just let's just get into it. Uh, the writer's name is Steve. He says, I've recently began listening to your stories about Bigfoot. It seems the creatures are widespread and not just restricted to any certain area. I once thought if they existed at all, it was only in the northwest states of Oregon, Washington, and northern California. This is the reason I'm writing you about incidents closer to my home here in Texas. My name is Steve, and I'm 69 years old. I was born and raised in Texas and have been involved with scouting since I was seven. I have backpacked extensively over the years and enjoy fishing, hunting, and so I would say that I'm the outdoors type. However, I'm not able to get out much now due to the issues I have with my back. The first incident happened in 1977 at Philmont Scout Ranch, which is in northern New Mexico. I was not on this particular trek, but a friend of mine was, and this is his story. Harry had just turned 21, so he was the adult advisor for this crew of seven scouts. These guys were older teens, meaning they were 16 to 17 years old. They had all been to Philmont before, so they were not newbies. One evening, they were sitting around their campfire, and after dinner, it suddenly became very quiet. It was as if a sudden hush had fallen. It was so abrupt that they all noticed it and were looking at each other. A huge black shape was seen as it bounded silently from the woods at the edge of the meadow. There were some huge logs on the ground in the middle of this mountain meadow, and this dark shape went from the woods to the first log, then to the second log, and to the third log before it vanished from sight. The distance from the woods to the far side of the meadow is probably 150 to 200 yards across. This thing that they saw made the crossing in just a few seconds before it vanished. Needless to say, The group was very spooked by what they had seen. Finally, Harry spoke up. That was the first sound anyone had made. They all got up and went over to where they first spotted the black object. Even though it had recently rained and the ground was soft, they found no tracks. They followed the course that it took all the way to the other side of the meadow. Still, no tracks. They were so shaken that instead of setting up their individual tents, They slept all together under the dining fly. All during the night, they were fighting each other for the centermost spot. No one, (laughs) I don't know why I think that's funny, but it's really not, but it kind of is. No one wanted to be on the outside edge. In the morning, they were all packed up and ready to roll within five minutes. They hit the trail, still edgy, and there was more than one look behind their backs. They left the area But this is not the end of the story. 20 years later, in 1997, Harry was again the adult advisor. This time we had two crews and I was the adult advisor for the second crew. While at the base camp, we made a plan for the coming days. One night was to be spent in Santa Claus, the same spot where Harry had his experience in 1977. 
We opted not to stay in that campsite, but to hike on a few miles to the next one. I was teasing Harry and generally giving him a hard time. It so happened that my crew was ahead of Harry's, and I had my crew stop at Santa Claus for about a 10-minute break. It was a beautiful meadow, and the birds were singing. And then the woods became hushed, and then all was quiet. Harry and his crew rounded the bend and came into view. When Harry and his group walked into the meadow, the silence was broken by the loud calling of crows. Harry said not a word as he passed by, but was nervously looking around. His face was pale. The crows kept up the racket the whole time Harry was in the meadow. It continued until he crossed through to the other side, and then the noise from the crows abruptly stopped. We never saw a crow in the air or roosting in a tree. There was no question that the crows were close. The noise was so loud that it was uncomfortable for our ears. Everyone stopped and listened, looking for, well, we don't know what. It was almost as if someone had an electronic call blasting in the middle of the meadow, but we would have seen that. I think it was the creature Harry had seen mimicking another animal, and it wanted us confused and to make us afraid. It wanted us out of the area. Everyone had heard Harry's story on this trip. We all wanted out of Santa Claus. We kept hiking until we were out of the area and camped in another spot. Yeti Bars Soap Company is sponsoring this episode of the What If It's True podcast. They make a dozen different types of soap with different scents and different ingredients. I bought six bars about two weeks ago and I'm almost down to a sliver on the Yeti Hippie number one. The soaps are priced economically compared to their competitors and the soap lasts a long time. Two weeks for a bar of soap? Man, it's awesome. They've got all kind of scents and varieties of their soap, many for women, many for men. You guys go check them out at yetibars.net. And at checkout, if you'll enter the code DC10, you'll get a 10% discount. Go check them out, yetibars.net. I live in Southwest Virginia in the Appalachian Mountains. And as a child, I ran wild through the fields and the woods. I would play in the woods without fear until the shadows would start to lengthen and then I would leave the woods. Once dark, I would not even go near the edge of the woods. Growing up, we had some really bad neighbors, really wrong turn type neighbors. And one night while laying in bed with the window open, I heard a crazy laughter coming down the mountainside. It passed through the house and continued down into the valley. I'm laying there terrified. So-and-so has gone crazy. As soon as the laughter fades, I hear what sounds like someone taking a hammer to a watermelon right outside my window. I refuse to look outside, and I have no idea what it was. I don't think I slept at all that night. Another weird incident in my life occurred in my early 20s. I was married at the time to my first husband, and there were six of us that would hang out together. It was my husband and myself, his brother and his girlfriend, and his best friend and his girlfriend. On this particular day, we were going to meet at one of the two local campgrounds in the National Forest to hang out around a campfire and drink and laugh and generally have a good time. We circled through one campground and we didn't see anyone. We headed further up the mountain to the other campground only to find that they were not there either. We sat for a few minutes deciding which campground to hang out at, waiting for them to show when we heard a crashing coming towards us through the woods. We were on a knoll, and it was at dusk, so we couldn't see what was making the noise. It was coming closer and getting louder and more violent. We decided it might be best for us to leave, not knowing what it was. To get out of the campground, we had to go back to where the crashing was coming from. This campground was higher than the road, and as we made our way down, I looked behind us, and right as my husband braked, I thought I saw something. I even thought it was following us, and my husband put on the brakes again. I couldn't see the gravel road. All I could see was a furry torso. 
I yelled, something is following us. And so my husband floored it and we go fishtailing down this gravel road in a souped up Camaro with whatever this thing was right on our bumper. I don't remember how long it followed us, but my memory says one minute is the amount of time that it was right behind us. And the next minute it was gone. I don't think we ever went back up there after dark. The next incident is one that really creeped me out. First, I'll give you a little history. The road I live on and grew up traveling follows a rather large creek and was once a railroad. The original road runs along the opposite side of the creek and crisscrosses back and forth across the creek and the current road. One section of the old road is called Red Banks because it's a red clay cliff that rises up from the creek and the road runs along top of this clay bank and then it collapses a lot. Supposedly, during the 50s, a man ran his wife off the road in her car at this spot, and her body was never recovered. My brother claims that on certain nights, you can hear her scream. I always thought it was a legend until one day, during a break at the factory I worked at, an elderly man walked up to me and commented that he heard I was from so-and-so county and proceeded to tell me about his daughter being murdered by her husband at Red Banks in the 50s. This was the late 80s or early 90s. Jump ahead to about six years ago, and this road is closed to traffic because the bank has collapsed again, taking half the road with it, so my son and I decided that it was a good place to take walks. The closed section is surrounded by woods on both sides, and there are no houses. On this particular day, I decided to walk by myself. I passed the last of the houses, and I slipped through the barriers. On one side was thick brush, and then on the other side was open woods. The road curves at the brush and slopes uphill to run between the clay bank and the woods. As I cleared the brush, my sudden appearance startled something and it took off running up the hill, but I didn't see anything. There was no movement, not even a leaf kicking up, but I could track it by its footfalls as it ran up the hill through the dry leaves with a crunch, crunch, crunch. It was a two-legged run. So I was standing there frantically searching for any movement, and I saw none. The hair rose up on the back of my neck, and I got goosebumps. Needless to say, I turned left, and I never walked through there again. Not long after that, we moved about three miles further up the road to an area that's more remote. The house is surrounded on all sides by mountains. The house literally sits in a valley. You can turn a full circle and see nothing but woods towering over the house. One day, my youngest son and I had gone to visit my parents and stayed past dark. We parked at the garage, which is about 50 feet from the house and closer to the road and the creek. When we exited the car, we could hear crashing in the woods on the other side of the road, and I stopped to see if any deer would appear. The crashing got louder, and you could hear tree branches cracking. I remember thinking, okay, that's not a deer. Maybe it's a bear. The longer we stood there, the more violent the sounds became, and I realized that whatever it was, it was going in circles, and I thought that if it was a bear, it's one pissed off bear, and I immediately got a mental image of a Bigfoot. I looked at my son and I commented that maybe we shouldn't just stand there, and he took off running and he left me. I yelled for him, wait for me, and I took off after him. On another day, unbeknownst to me, my older son left the bathroom curtain and window open from his trying to catch a spotty cell signal, and the sun was going down. The bathroom sat at the end of a small hall, and as I popped around the corner into the hall, I saw a face staring back at me through the window screen. The window is 10 to 12 feet off the ground. Then I heard bangs on the house, and the windows on the enclosed back porch sounded like hands slapping them, and then we heard tree knocks in the distance. Woohoos on the real quiet nights, and there are a lot of oddities with the trees and the woods around the house. Last year, my oldest son and his girlfriend claimed to see something huge with eyes shine across the road from the garage on the creek. I haven't seen a Bigfoot full on, and I rather hope I don't, because if I do, I may never go in the woods again. My encounter happened in August of 1978. 
I had been working on my motorcycle late one night. When I finished the task, I decided to take the bike for a ride. It was hot that night and a cool ride sounded perfect. After riding up into the hills of Middle Tennessee, I pulled off at an old fire tower. It was still hot and muggy, so I walked to a well that had been running there for years to get a cool drink of water. It was still dark all around me. I walked around the parking lot to loosen up and then get back on the bike for the ride home. I made a circle around the lot to get to the exit, and my headlight illuminated a giant creature standing just at the edge of the wood's edge. I was in motion, and it took a minute to stop and turn the handlebars so that the light would shine back on the creature. I stood up watching this thing. It was a Bigfoot, no doubt. It matched the classic description, an enormous body compared to an adult human male. I noticed its teeth first because his arm was raised to block the light from its eyes, and its teeth were showing as if it were squinting. The teeth were almost white and square. Long brown hair hung from its arms as it shielded its eyes from the light. I was close enough to see that its chest had less hair than the rest of the body, and ashy gray skin was clearly visible. The chest was thick and the muscles in its arms and legs were defined. The creature looked to be an exceptional shape. And last, it looked more human than animal. In no way did this creature look like an ape. Within a few seconds, it turned to walk back into the woods. And as it did, I saw him push a fairly large limb out of the way with its right arm up and over its head. As it made this motion, I distinctly remember it leaning its head to the left as if it was ducking under the limb. In other words, it had a neck that allowed its head to lean much like a human. The last thing I saw were its big legs moving up the incline and then out of sight. And then it was gone. There was no sound that I know of. My bike was running and I doubt I would have heard anything anyway. I kicked down and putting the bike in gear and I calmly drove away. There was nothing left to see. The next day I rode back up to the parking area and I got the height of the limb that the creature had walked under. It was just head high to the creature. I measured eight feet, give or take an inch. Remember that it pushed the branch up and also leaned its head down, making the creature taller than eight feet. That was 42 years ago, and I've never seen anything like this since. I never once felt threatened. Rather, I felt more curious than anything. I'm sorry I blinded it with my headlight that night. I know that wasn't comfortable for him but I was looking at a real live Bigfoot and I knew it. I'm sorry this encounter is short, but it is exactly what happened. Here's an email from John. John writes, I've been listening to your channel for some time now, and I've really enjoyed the stories you read. I thought it was time that I sent you two stories that I believe to be intertwined. I heard these stories many times, beginning at a very young age. Every time that the family was together, I would ask them to tell me these stories again. I believe that was when the fascination with Bigfoot started with me. And here are the stories. My father grew up in rural Wayne County, West Virginia in the early 1960s. He was the oldest son of nine children. In those days, all of the girls slept in one bedroom, the boys in another room, and my grandparents in a third room. This was a long time before air conditioning, and everyone slept with their windows open. One midsummer night, my grandparents were woken by screams coming from the girls' room. They ran to the room to see about the commotion and saw one of their daughters hanging headfirst halfway out the window with the other girls holding on to her legs. My grandmother sprang into action and grabbed her, attempting to pull her back into the window. Meanwhile, my grandfather ran outside to see if he could help her down from the yard. 
As he burst out of the front door and rounded the house, he saw a huge figure in the moonlight running towards the tree line. He was shocked to see that it had been trying to pull his daughter out of the window, and it was a window at least six feet off the ground. Thankfully, as soon as this thing let go, my grandmother and the other girls were able to pull her back inside safely. When my grandparents asked their daughter what had happened, she said that she was asleep in the bed near the window when she woke to something pulling her hair. She thought it was a dream at first because she wasn't quite awake. She soon realized it was no dream, however, when the creature, whatever it was, started dragging her by the hair, its large hairy arm pulling her out the window. Finally awake, she screamed, waking the other girls and my grandparents. After that traumatic night, there was no other instances for some time. Later that year, one of my uncles went out to the far end of the yard to get water from the family well. There was a burn pile past the well for burning trash. No one picked up garbage in those days. My uncle came towards the well and he saw something large and black rummaging in the trash pile. Although bears were uncommon in the area, he still assumed the animal was a bear and he ran back to the house to tell my grandfather. My grandfather and the other boys took their shotguns and ran to the well. They figured that whatever it was would be gone by the time they arrived, but it was still there. Not only was it still there, but when it saw them coming towards the well, it stood up and stared back at them in defiance. It was seven to eight feet tall. It was covered in black hair, not fur. The hair was as long as a man's hand, and it had a very stocky build with long arms. Instinctively, my grandfather put the gun to his shoulder, and he fired. All of the boys followed suit and began to unload on the creature. The creature was close enough that my father saw the creature's hair move where the buckshot was hitting. Evidently, the shotguns were of little effect on it. It let out a horrible scream and it ran for the tree line. Shortly after that, the family moved away with no other encounters to speak of. I have no doubt they had an encounter with a Bigfoot. I hope you enjoy these stories as much as I have through the years. Signed, John. Hey y'all, before we get into this video, I want to share with you an email that I got a few weeks ago, maybe actually a couple of weeks ago, from a friend I've made out west. Uh, His name is Dusty and he lives really, I, I don't know if it's the wilderness or what, but he sent me pictures of his place and there's grizzly bears in his front yard. So he lives in in a wild place. But he's an attorney. He was a he was a judge. I don't know if he's retired or what. But he's just a damn good guy. And he sent me this email. It's not a story, but it's something to really think about. And I wanted to read it to you. He writes: I spent the better part of five decades unraveling extremely difficult situations in an effort to discard the irrelevant facts and apply the correct law to the relevant facts. I excelled at this. There is a common denominator in this entire Sasquatch, Dogman, Alien picture that can't be overlooked that is the government's harsh and volatile reaction to those who might reveal aspects of their encounters with these entities. If you recall the Skinwalker Ranch scenario, Sasquatch and Dogman-like creatures were actually seen documented coming out of portals. Creatures were shot out of trees on the ranch and shot at such extreme close range that hunks of meat were seen flying off the creatures, only to have their tracks literally vanish into thin air when they were followed into the bush by expert Indian trackers. 
Likewise, and to an even much greater extent, the Stardust Ranch scenario, where a myriad of strange and bizarre aliens and cryptid creatures were witnessed exiting portals. The four-corner section of the U.S. where Arizona, Utah, Nevada, and New Mexico meet is apparently littered with these portals and is a hotbed of cryptid activity. Whether these portals are pathways to different dimensions or galaxies, I know not, but one thing is consistent, and that is the zealous and hostile manner in which the government attempts to cover up these events. The reaction of the U.S. government to the Rendlesham Forest incident where UFOs landed at a British Air Force base being operated by the U.S. and England, or the Roswell debacle and so many more, was to threaten witnesses with loss of jobs, reputations, livelihoods, and even their lives if they reveal that which they witnessed. One GI who witnessed the event called his mother from an off-base payphone. He was dishonorably discharged and his life was ruined. Others high up in government who dared divulge this information have met untimely ends. Those reporting serious conflicts with dogmen go on to recite that the proverbial men in black show up, hunt down the creature, and then remove all trail cams on the individual's properties, as well as removing hard drives from computers in their homes before disappearing forever. As you are well aware, this is not an uncommon occurrence. So what's the common denominator? The government reacts harshly and covertly in both instances. They treat UFO encounters and abductions in the same manner that they treat serious conflicts with cryptids and humans. In very serious cases where groups of Sasquatches have terrorized a farm or ranch, the feds buy the property and then literally burn the structures to the ground and destroy all evidence of the altercations. Robert Bigelow, a billionaire who purchased and scientifically studied the Skinwalker Ranch, formed the National Institute for the Discovery of Science, which operated until 2004. The organization is later replaced by the Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies. This guy is no lightweight. His investigation, which utilized the services of top-notch technical and scientific minds, points conclusively to the link between cryptids and alien beings. They're linked, Cam. As much as I hate to admit it, and as many times as I have rejected it, the accounts in serious scientific studies point conclusively to the conclusion that the Earth is not the natural habitat of these beings. Strange lights are reported around them. They seem to be able to vanish into thin air. It all adds up. The government will discard the Constitution and all the rights of associated therewith to protect the secret that aliens exist and cryptids are part and parcel of the program. I have no one else to blow this by. <laughs> Dusty writes, I have no one else to blow this by, so I thought I'd pick on you. Oh, look, here come the men in white coats to take me back to my home. I hope I haven't missed the apple cobbler. Keep up the good work, Dusty. Here's another really good story from a First Nations man. Here's what he writes. My name is Paul and I'm 36 years old. I'm a First Nations man who is an avid outdoorsman and a hunter. I spend a lot of time in the forest and I enjoy the solitude the forest has to offer. The people of the Nishka Nation is who I belong to. My people are from the beautiful Nass Valley, which is located in the northwest coast of British Columbia, and we've been living in this area for over 10,000 years. Our elders and ancestors are fully aware of the existence of Bigfoot. Our area is surrounded by tall timber mixed with dense forest and high mountains, and this provides an excellent habitat for these beings to exist. There are hundreds of sightings and encounters to be heard over the years from locals and tourists alike. September is the month that pine mushroom season is in full effect. 
there are many people combing the deep woods in search for pine mushrooms. Growing up and hearing the stories from frequent sightings in the valley and around the community I grew up in, I always had an interest in having my own sighting or encounter. The nearest town is 110 kilometers, and as a kid playing in a soccer league, my parents would drive me there to play sports. I was 10 at the time, and my mother and I were 20 kilometers away from home on our way back from a soccer game. It was a nice midsummer day, and we were taking our time, enjoying our ride back. She must have only been driving about 50 kilometers per hour. There was an old road to our right, not to the point where it was overgrown, but clearly it was not maintained. It was there that I saw my first Sasquatch. He must have been nine feet tall. He was dark black and with broad shoulders. We caught him standing in the middle of the road 40 yards away from the main line. It was my peripheral vision that caught his view while we were driving and I immediately looked towards him. My mother noticed it too. I tried to get her to stop the vehicle and go back to get another look, but she was too afraid. To this day, on my return trips back home, I always look down that now fully overgrown road in hopes to see him again. I've been told that it is a blessing to see one because they choose to make themselves visible to you. It could be that over a period of time, they watch you making a daily commute and sense something about you and they want to make a connection, even if it is just for a brief moment. Well, this is my story. I've only shared it with a select few people, and now I'm happy to share it with you. Here's an email from Tom, and he titles this story, Swamp Tales. My family has lived in the Deep South for nearly 400 years. My father's side came to Virginia from Scotland in 1646, courtesy of the British. My mother's family came from France in 1700 to what was then French Louisiana. They both lived in old family homes with the ghosts of previous generations. We are now mostly in Louisiana and Mississippi. We've always been farmers, hunters, fishermen, and sometimes trappers. We live on the land and off what we can make the land produce. I came into the world in Bastrop, Louisiana in 1946. From the time I was able to keep up, I was taken hunting and fishing by my father, brothers, or my grandfather. I also spent considerable time helping with the planting and harvesting. When I reached the age of 12, I was given my first shotgun. It was also the age that most southern boys are introduced into the company of men other than their relatives. This is a rite of passage as much as any debutante ball for southern women. If you listen and apply yourself, you will be taught things. For example, when you kill your first deer, you're excited and proud of what you've accomplished. But there's a serious moment about it, too. Your father or the oldest man in the group will take the deer's blood and cover your face with it. This is a reminder that there are consequences each time you pull the trigger of a weapon. The deer died so that you can feed yourself and your family. Remember that. There are also lighter teaching moments. When you miss a shot, they cut off your shirt tail and they stuff the cloth in your hunting coat or your vest pocket. You're going to be ribbed in good nature for the rest of the day, and it teaches you that everyone misses and not to take yourself too seriously. I remember my coming-of-age year for another reason. It was Friday afternoon, and I had just gotten home from school. My father and brother had our gear packed as we were all going to the Tensas River to fish and camp overnight. Usually, our fishing was just day trips, although our hunting trips could last a full month. On this night, we would be meeting other men, and we would be running trot lines for the big catfish this river is known for. 
We arrived just before dark, and after driving a couple of miles through the woods down a well-worn dirt road that followed the river, there were eleven in all, counting my father, my brother, me, and my grandfather, who had come early to set up. The campsite was right on the river bank in a cleared area. The fire pit in the center had not been lit, but the old Coleman gas lanterns had started to sputter and come alive. I noticed each man was armed with exception of me. Louisiana is known for its panthers, bears, wolves, alligators, and other critters. The Tensas River area was no exception. The trot lines had been baited earlier in the evening and the boats were pulled up on the bank. Dinner had just started cooking. My first test started when I was asked how I liked the armadillo and turtle stew that I was eating. The cook said he had hit the armadillo with his car and he didn't want to waste it. Being 12, I figured he was telling the truth and I said it was good, but I had had enough, thank you. Knowing looks and smiles all around and so it went on for an hour. Two hours after we arrived, it was time to check the trot lines. The boat occupied by three men pushed off and slowly, hook by hook, to remove any caught fish and rebate them. Something large was thrown into the water near the boat. The man that was paddling immediately started scanning the river bank behind him with a spotlight. They continued to remove the fish and rebate the hooks, and then there was another big splash. Upon reaching the bank, one of the fellows near me asked if the boaters had seen an alligator and splashed the water with the paddle to scare it. He said he hadn't. A large piece of wood appeared to have been thrown. The men exchanged knowing looks. Some men moved closer to their weapons. For the next few hours, it continued. Splashes in the water, thuds in the woods behind, some close to us, all thrown pieces of wood. I finally went to sleep. It had been a long day with school and then the trip, but no one else slept that night. The fire was kept burning, as were the lanterns. No one left the circle of light that night, other than the fellows running the trot lines. Even then, they kept scanning the banks and the woods with their spotlights. Dawn came with a mist on the water. The last fish were removed and the trot lines were pulled in. The campsite was broken down and cleaned up and everyone packed up. I noticed quiet conversations going on, but none included me. They seemed relieved to be leaving. One of the men, a Cajun from South Louisiana, left a big catfish hanging on a tree when we left. A month later, my father was deer hunting in La Petite La Fourche Swamp. Let me see if I can say that right. La Petite La Fourche Swamp. It is ancient, dark, and vast, and it is home to large alligators, panthers, wolves, and bear in quicksand and deep water. Its canopy is so thick that it is always gloomy. It is also full of ancient Indian mounds in the shape of animals and serpents. As much as I like deer hunting, I never felt comfortable in there, and I usually did not go along if they were hunting La Fourche, even if it did offer many large deer. My grandfather and my brothers were handling the dogs. My father found a small clearing where he could see any deer that might be driven towards him. He sat down on a large pine tree log and listened to the dogs in the distance. The tree was 18 inches in diameter and it was 30 feet long. One end had fallen into a cane break. As he sat there listening, he started smelling something foul. Looking around, he could see nothing that might be causing it. Later, the log suddenly started to vibrate as if someone was hitting it, but it made no sound. Then all at once, the log was twisted about a quarter of a turn, nearly sending him over on his back. He grabbed a shotgun and he looked towards the cane break. Something dark and hairy was in the cane at the end of the log. He assumed it was a bear and he took off, never seeing what it was. Thinking it through, my father later said there's no way a bear could have moved that tree trunk. Whatever it was could spin the 30-foot, 18-inch diameter log, so it must have been really strong. 
On two other occasions, while squirrel hunting with my father-in-law for Shea Swamp, we would smell that stink, and my dad would stop and tell me to switch out my squirrel shot to buckshot or a slug. After I did so, he would do the same. Then we both would slowly back out of there and we'd go home. We didn't even consider finding another place to hunt on those days. We were done. I never questioned his judgment about things like that. One day when I was 12, my grandfather came home and he was upset. He stopped by our house and told my dad that he had been down in La Forche Swamp. He had taken three of his dogs down to exercise them and they had not come back to him when he blew his hunting horn as they were trained to do. He waited until almost dark, continually blowing his horn, but with no luck. They never showed up. He finally had to leave since La Forche Swamp is no place to be after dark. My father and my grandfather both agreed that they would go back early the next morning and try to find the dogs. They spent that whole day driving up and down the narrow road that passes the edge of La Forche, stopping, blowing their hunting horns and listening for the dogs to answer. Nothing was ever seen or heard. This went on for several days. My dad finally had to get back to work, as did my grandfather. The loss of the dogs began to affect my grandfather's health. He loved those dogs. These were not just pets. These dogs were valuable, and they had taken years to train. They were known throughout the local hunting community, and they were like family to some of us who hunted with them. It was thought that possibly they had been picked up by another hunter or killed by a gator or a panther or had been trapped in quicksand. None of these possibilities were good to think about. A week after the dogs went missing, my grandfather was at work. He was telling a friend who worked in the hospital kitchen about his missing dogs. My grandfather was an ambulance driver. A lady who worked in the kitchen overheard the conversation and later took my grandfather aside and told him that she knew of an old man who had the gift of finding lost things. His name was Mr. Wills, and she could tell Grandpa where to find him if he wanted to ask for help. My grandpa said yes and was given the directions to Mr. Wills' home. I heard this part of the story, and I asked to go along. My grandfather, my dad, and I drove to a little tar paper shack in the poor section of our town on the edge of the woods. We pulled up into the little front yard, and an old man came to the front door. My grandpa told Mr. Wills who we were and the name of the lady who told us about him. My grandpa said that he wanted to ask for his help. Hearing this, Mr. Wills asked us inside. The little house was just one room with newspapers covering the walls, an old calendar photo for pictures, and a dinner table. There was also a cot and a bedside table with a Bible on it and a single light bulb hanging from the center of the high ceiling. My grandfather told Mr. Wills the entire story of the missing dogs. Mr. Wills listened quietly and then he took his Bible off the small bedside table and he began to read it. He read it quietly to himself for a few minutes. The rest of us sat in silence and we watched. Then he took his finger and he pointed to a verse on a page that he had not yet read and he repeated it out loud. Mr. Wills told my grandpa to go back down to La Forche Swamp in two days. Travel the road until you come to the bridge that crosses the river. Stop at the bridge on the road and blow your hunting horn and wait there. At this point, my grandpa asked Mr. Wills if he could pay him for his help. Mr. Wills said that he couldn't take money for it, but if he found the dogs, he would appreciate some food. Two days later, Grandpa, my dad, and I were at the bridge early in the morning. Grandpa blew his horn, and we waited and listened, but nothing happened. He tried again after 30 minutes, and we thought we heard dogs barking in the distance. Grandpa blew it again, and the barking sound got closer. He kept blowing it to give the dogs a sense of direction. Soon, we saw the dogs coming out of the swamp. These dogs were a mess. They were skinny. they were already hound dog loose skin hanging from their bones. They were wet and muddy, and they were tired. 
Their feet were cut up from the briars, but they were awfully glad to see us. Grandpa gave them water and a small bit of food, and we headed off to the vet and then home. The dogs were okay. They soon fattened up, and it was not long that they were back in the swamp hunting. Grandpa looked like a new man. Grandpa took Mr. Wills an ambulance full of summer vegetables that he would collect from farm stands along his route from New Orleans to our hometown. He had always done this for people who worked in the hospital kitchen. They didn't make much money and usually had large families to feed, so Grandpa helped where he could. He considered them his friends. It was perhaps his generosity to them and others that led the lady to tell him about Mr. Wills. We later learned, it seems, that Mr. Wills and his gift was kept only within that small community. Even after he retired, Grandpa would bring the people at the hospital food from his large gardens, and Mr. Wills was always on the list. By the way, he never lost a dog before or after this incident. I wonder if the scripture Mr. Wills read was something about reaping what you sow. Here's an email from Thomas, and Thomas writes, I joined the Navy in 1975. I went to boot camp in Orlando, Florida. I then went on to San Diego, California, where I went to CO school. I made a few friends while I was there, and I had expected to have some companions on the way to the East Coast when I transferred to the USS Capadano FF-1093, but that didn't happen, and I ended up driving across country by myself. I aired up the four tires on the ground and one in the trunk, and I left Los Angeles heading east to Tallahassee, Florida. I filled up with gas somewhere in Arizona, and I got back on the road. It was getting late, and I was getting tired. I'd been driving for several hours. A rest stop was coming up, and I pulled over to get some sleep before I moved on. I was the only car stopped at this rest area. It was cool on that mountain, so I pulled on a jacket, I locked the doors on my 1970 Ford Fairlane, and I closed my eyes and dozed off. I was jolted awake by something violently rocking my car. Still sleepy and not knowing what was going on, I looked around. A beautiful starlit night was out the front glass, and I could see some hills in my rearview mirror. I turned the headlights on to see better, and nothing seemed to be there. I looked around, and I still didn't see anything. The darkness seemed blacker when I turned my headlights off, though. After that, it got too quiet, and the shock of my car being tossed around gave me the creeps. Something had done that, something big. I started the car, and I sped out of the rest area, but I never saw anything. The trip to Tallahassee was eventful after this. I almost had a retread fly through my windshield. I later found that retread embedded in my grill. If it had come through the windshield, I wouldn't be telling this story. I got lost several times in Florida, but I finally found my base. I know this isn't an exciting story, but I wonder if it was a Bigfoot that shook my car. For some reason, that event has stuck in my mind. I never considered it to be a Bigfoot until I heard some of the stories that you shared. Okay, about two months ago, I put up a video called Bigfoot Sins Tweakers Running. It was a video, I think it had two stories in it, and both stories were handwritten, and they were both great. I mean, they were really good. But the second story was by a guy named Russell, who uh, I think out in Oklahoma, he had had some strange interactions with a Bigfoot and ran into some trouble with some dope heads, and, and the Bigfoot ran them off. And it was a great story. But at the end of the story, he mentioned that he had a story about a squirrel, and I guess, I guess through popular demand in the comments, people were like, oh, I want to hear the squirrel story. Got to hear the squirrel story. So last week, 
or no, maybe two weeks ago, I was checking my post office box and there was another handwritten letter from Rusty. And it is the story about the squirrel. And Rusty writes, In the early 80s, I was 20. Most of my friends and I didn't have families or careers yet, so we had plenty of free time to fish and hunt. That is, if we had a little money for gas and maybe some beer. $10 meant both back then. I had just finished up a job and got paid for it. I called up my buddies, Bullet and Jack, and I said, let's go fishing. We all did that if one of us had money because we all shared it. We borrowed Jack's brother's John boat and went down to one of the little rivers that flow in and out of the Great Dismal Swamp in northeast North Carolina. It was a beautiful day, early fall, but still warm enough for shorts. We slid the boat into the water and started out. We always paddled upstream then and drifted back down. Those were small, slow, flowing rivers, so it was easy going. We were catching fish like always, keeping only the bigger ones, perch, bass, and catfish. That was when we realized that you can catch catfish on lures. Anyway, we had gone about a mile up and half of the 12-pack was gone. It had just disappeared. So we turned around and started drifting back. In North Carolina, nothing runs in a straight line, especially the waterways. It was a good day of fishing with friends and stories. Then, just around the next bend, we could hear a squirrel chattering. Then we heard a splash in the water, and then more splashing and squeals from the squirrel. We all looked at each other asking, what in the world is going on over there? We all put our rods up, and Jack and Bullet started paddling towards the ruckus with me sitting on the bow. When we rounded the bend, we could see a snake wound around a squirrel. The squirrel was struggling and biting at the snake. Now, you would think it was a moccasin being near the water and all, but it wasn't. It was just a regular old snake. Later on, we figured the squirrel jumped on the snake and started fighting it. I had to break it up somehow. I told the guys to get me close. I started to whack the ball of snake and fur with the end of my rod, and eventually the snake uncoiled itself and swam off. The squirrel, however, wasn't doing so well. I could see it wasn't going to make it back to the bank. So I put the tip of the rod in the water and the squirrel latched on. I pulled it right up into the boat with us. It was something right out of a Warner Brothers cartoon. A half-drowned squirrel coughing and spitting out water sitting on the bow of the boat right beside me. Bullet and Jack never said a word. When I turned to look at them, I could see why. Both of their jaws were in their laps and their eyes were as big as saucers. I said, let's get him to the bank. They got us right up to the bank, but the squirrel just sat there shivering and coughing. It took about a minute, but the squirrel finally hopped off. He didn't run, but walked only a few feet, and he turned and he chirped at us, as if to say thanks, and then ran to the nearest tree, and he disappeared. I turned to look at the guys again, and that's when I had the biggest laugh I can remember ever having. We went back to town to tell the story. No one believed us, but it's another one of those believe it or leave it alone stories. I'm 57 years old and a deputy sheriff for over 20 years in Kansas City, Missouri. In the early 70s, there were stories or legends or whatever about a monster in Kansas City, mostly on the Kansas side. If it was in Kansas City, Missouri, I didn't hear about it. Anyway, supposedly, there were sightings from time to time of Bigfoot, Sasquatch-like creatures roaming the area. It was called the Momo Monster, which is short for Missouri Monster. There's a park close to where I grew up. I heard that someone had seen a black bear down there, but I didn't believe it. I have never seen a bear in the wild. Around here, we have foxes, coyotes, and an occasional bobcat. Near the river and a little further north, we have cougars, but no bears. I was about 14 years old when the stories were prevalent. The word would get out that the Momo monster was out and everyone in the neighborhood would stay in the house. I had a girlfriend at that time, and man, was she pretty. In fact, in my opinion, she was the prettiest girl in Kansas City. 
Anytime a monster sighting came up, however, she would not leave her house. This would infuriate me to no end. I didn't think there was any such thing as a blankety-blank Momo monster for crying out loud. A few decades later, I became deputy sheriff for many years. I was at a gas station in Kansas City, Missouri, when I saw a business truck with a name as the same as a good friend of mine, a friend who left the department suddenly and he never looked back. The name is a very unique name, so I asked the man pumping the gas if he happened to be related to my friend. He answered, well, it depends on who's asking. I told him my name and that I worked with the former detective by this name, and I'd like to give him my contact info. While I was pumping my gas, he called his brother, who was more than happy to hear from me. He talked for a good while and told me to hand the phone back to his brother and wait a minute. He spoke to him, and I heard him say, are you sure? All right, if you say so, and then he hung up the phone, and he related this story to me. Back in the early 70s, when he and his brother were Kansas City police officers, he was dispatched to a call of a woman being attacked by a man in her home. When he and his partner arrived on the scene, these are his words, it wasn't a man, and it wasn't a monkey. He says this thing was around six feet something, and when they got there, it tried to get out of the window, but there were bars on the outside. He said they had it at gunpoint and looked at one another and said, what the heck? At that instant, the creature bolted past them and ran towards the river, which is about a block away from the house. He was very serious. He said they were mocked and teased by their fellow officers, but he swore to me on his mother's grave that that's what he saw. He also said that other officers and citizens had seen it and made reports. I guess my beautiful former girlfriend probably saved my butt in the 70s because she wouldn't come outside when the monster was out. Oh, she did save your butt, man. That kept me inside. I have since heard of many encounters in the area. Recently, a young friend of mine who was an avid hunter relayed to me that he and his dad were driving down a road near Peculiar, Missouri and saw a nine foot brown Bigfoot walk into the woods in broad daylight. Until then, he was a mocker of the cryptid believers. There have also been stories of the dog man near that same area. I personally have not seen one and I don't want to either. I want to share with you my brother's encounter with a Sasquatch that happened around 1990 near a town called Gary's Creek, which is near Fayetteville, North Carolina. I've always been fascinated with Bigfoot ever since I was a kid of seven or eight. I even went with my friend one night to see Sasquatch, the legend of Bigfoot, at a local theater, and that movie scared the heck out of both of us. I recently rewatched the movie and I had to laugh because I could hardly believe I was ever scared of this chunk of cheese. <laughs> oh, what a way to describe a movie, a chunk of cheese. <laughs> my family also knew of my fascination. I believe my dad was interested too because every time there was a Bigfoot documentary on TV, he was right there watching it with my brother and I. My parents even gave me a copy of Peter Burns' Bigfoot book for my birthday one year, and I must have read it a hundred times. The following incident happened around the year 1990. I was chatting with my mother on the phone, and she asked how I enjoyed a recent camping trip that I had taken with some friends. I made a joke about how we didn't see Bigfoot, but we did have a great time regardless, to which she replied, well... Your brother would be happy to learn that. When I asked her what she meant, she seemed surprised that he'd never told me. When I pressed her, she informed me that Larry, my brother, had an extraordinary Bigfoot encounter a few years back. I was rather PO'd that Larry hadn't told me about this. He knew of my lifelong interest in this subject. I hung up with my mother and immediately called Larry. What's the big idea of being Harry Holdout with the news of an encounter that you never told me about? He guessed correctly that Mom had told me. He said he would go ahead and tell me, but to not ask any questions. 
Well, I thought that was strange, but I went along out of love and respect for my brother. And then he told me this story. Larry was working as a delivery man for a local branch of a nationwide pizza chain. He was tasked to deliver some pizzas to a college fraternity house. Larry's car was in the shop at the time, so he was driving his boss's pickup truck. He delivered the pizzas and was driving back through Grays Creek, North Carolina, on a road with overhanging oak trees. Bocephus was playing on the radio, he said, and the windows were down, and he was enjoying the cool evening air. He heard a loud bang in the bed of the truck. He slammed on the brakes while looking in the rearview mirror and could see something black up against the rear window. When he got to a full stop, he saw something flailing around and it managed to work its way to the open tailgate and roll out of the truck bed. Larry sat there stunned looking in the rear view mirror, trying to figure out what this thing was. He stood up on two feet and it grew to seven feet tall. He tilted the mirror to see its face. Larry focused on the thing's face to see it looking right back at him. The face was human-like and had a murderous, hate-filled expression, and then it roared. Larry ain't no dummy. He turned and stomped on the gas because he knew that if this thing got its hands on him, it would absolutely tear him apart. Larry says he has no recollection of driving back to the pizza joint, just that the next thing he knew that he was getting out of the truck and his knees buckled, and he would have fallen flat had he not managed to catch himself on the door's armrest. He said he stayed squatted and gulping for air for several minutes, and then he went in trying to look like he was okay. Larry's boss looked at him, and he knew something was wrong. He was pale, and his eyes were big and wide open. Apparently, Larry looked so bad that his boss drove him home that minute. He has no memory of the ride home or talking with his boss on the ride. My mother walked Larry back to his room so he could lay down while my dad and Larry's boss looked at the truck. The part of the bed's sides near the rear window were crumpled downwards and there was blood in the bed as well as some tufts of hair. They both picked up on the bad odor as well. Our father said it was a horrible smell. Mom and Dad sat up with Larry all night. He was obviously in a state of shock. They wanted to take him to the hospital, but Larry insisted that he was okay. He related his story to both Mom and Dad a little while after, and they both believed him. My parents are not gullible people. They're well-grounded and not prone to believe everything they hear. Trust me on that one. A year later, Mom and Dad, my wife and I, and Larry and his family were vacationing together, and I was excited that I get to ask him about his experience face-to-face. -face. I sat down with a notepad and a pen. I was even planning to record the conversation with a new app on my phone. He looked at both and said, No way. I don't want you submitting this to any Bigfoot organization, and furthermore, this is going to be the last time we talk about this. You got it? I agreed and asked some questions that helped fill in the blanks in the account. I have a bit more to tell you about my brother. When he was relating what happened to me during our vacation, I saw both fear in his eyes and goosebumps rose on his arms more than once. And you can't fake that. What really hammered things home for me is the fact that my brother is a formal special forces operator and he served a tour over in the sandbox. He just does not get rattled. To speak for myself, I never heard of a Sasquatch dropping from a tree into a truck before. From Larry's report, he had a hunch. It just lost its grip and somehow fell into the bed of the truck. I'd be willing to bet the Sasquatch trackways people find that abruptly end is because these things take to the trees. I'm going to share with you a story that I received uh, this past June, June 2019. It's a long story, but it's really good. And what this woman does, her name is Margie. 
she gives us an outline, hits the high point of a, it's almost like a nine year odyssey with Bigfoot. And it's really, really interesting. And I love reading it. And I think you will too. Let's jump into it. She titles it nine years living with Bigfoot. My husband and I are so happy to have found your program and the stories from other listeners. My husband is a psychologist from one of the biggest cities in the world, and over the past 20 years, I have opened him up to nature. My grandfather taught me about nature, tracks, scat, plants, and trees in the Gifford Pinchot Forest of Washington State. We are both with native blood, and we follow the ways of our native relatives. In my early adult life, I studied wild canines through Purdue University. After five years of study, I had the opportunity to live 14 years in the pure Alaskan tundra with gray timber wolves. I only tell you this so that you and your listeners don't think we're crackpots, since so many, including my son, do not believe that these creatures exist. Nine years ago, my husband and I took on the task of being caretakers and hosts of an educational forest, the same as the camp hosts. We started in September and we moved our RV on site. After living in an RV park, this forest was a breath of fresh air. The forest had many varieties of tall evergreens and a blend of deciduous trees. In the morning, the evergreen tops would look like the tips of flame licking the morning sky as we took our coffee outdoors. Right away, we experienced odd noises and whistles. My husband and I would cook outside on our deck, which was fenced in. Some afternoons, we'd be cooking and a strong odor would rise from the undeveloped, heavily timbered valley just over the hill from our house. I always assumed it was something dead, maybe a deer, maybe a cougar kill, but I paid little mind to the things that were natural to the forests. After a day of moving in, we were on our first daylight Kubota ride through six miles of roads and trails, and we came upon a recently killed deer in the road. But this wasn't roadkill or a deer killed by a hunter. The deer was boned out, but the carcass was still complete. The only bones we could see left in the animal were its skull and its front legs. Our hearts were pounding because things weren't right. But silly us, we passed it off as a poacher, but I could never square the boned out carcass in my mind. After that, we experienced strange things each day. Usually what happened today would be even more weird than the day before. One of our neighbors was a strange and eccentric woman. This woman would build fires in the woods and dance around the fire in the moonlight alone. She drank a lot of beer and she left cans scattered all about. At night, she would pull up in her camouflage truck and steal firewood from us, or she would sneak around with a bucket, picking all the trillium she could find with a flashlight. We began to think we were living on Murder Mountain. We were constantly nervous. There had been enough craziness from the crazy neighbor girl that we opted to install a night vision camera. We hooked the camera up on a short tripod facing the entrance road so we could manage the crazy neighbor and the occasional carloads of teens looking for a place to party. We felt a bit more secure being able to see what was going on outside our home on a 32-inch TV. During our time there, the corporation allowed a group to use the forest to teach forest survival skills. There were instructors with young students running around in the forest, making overnight survival huts and filling them with leaves. The survival huts look like a fish backbones with the ribs touching the ground to hold it up. After the survivalists left, the corporation asked us to go take the shelters down. It was policy to leave no trace. We completed the task and got them all removed. Not long after this, we started seeing more of these shelters. They were a little larger and more teepee-like. We found an odd one that had a plastic bag stuffed in it. We reported the new shelters to the owner and told him that it appeared the survivalists were back using the woods without permission. The owner was not a nice man and refused to believe what we told him. We never mentioned it again, and we left the shelters alone. 
The seasons passed and the odors that we thought were strange at first became normal as we cooked outside. The whistles continued as well as the tree branches breaking in the woods close to our home. Even the occasional green trees falling when there had been no wind became the usual course of events. It was the forest and we accepted all of it as natural. On a Saturday in 2015, my husband had to check out the undeveloped part of the woods below our RV site. He was gone for hours, and I had become nervous. When he got back, he burst through the door so excited. He had photos of footprints in the mud from a pond we didn't even know was there. But that wasn't all. The trail to the pond was cleared of branches like someone broke them six feet high and cleared the way. On his way back, he noticed a cave-style opening in the scrub brush. Inside this thicket stood a large teepee structure. It would have taken several men to build this thing. The opening to this structure and the ground under it showed frequent use. One night, we heard noises outside, so my husband went to investigate. He immediately saw something run into the woods, and he followed. It sounded like a bull crashing through the forest. And when my husband came back, I laughed and told him that I would never take him hunting and that he made so much noise running through the woods. He told me it was not him making the noise. It was that huge thing running through the woods. And whatever it was, it was as fast as a deer. On nice afternoons, I would take my border collie, Nina, with me to capture nature photographs. The plant life and the wildlife made the whole area magical in my eyes. One day, my dog started tugging at my coat collar. She wanted to go. I would settle her down and she would lay down on the seat, but soon bounce back up and look around, sometimes growling. On many days as we made our route, she would sit looking out the back screen of the Kubota growling and shaking. Many times while I was alone in the forest, I would hear men talking. It was garbled speech and nothing could be understood. It was strange. Not far away from a creek was running, and I rode it off as the water making the noises that sounded like men talking. One afternoon, I turned off the main road and drove into this heavily overgrown area. There were small waterfalls with ferns growing close by. Again, it was magical there. There were so many dragonflies there, and I imagined them as fairies flying about. I absolutely loved going there. There was a day, finally, that I did not feel like I was alone. I got a mental message of being in danger. Without panic, I turned the rig around and took Nina and I back to the main road. I know I was followed from that area for a long distance, but who knows by what. After this experience, I would not accompany my husband while going in the forest anymore. In the spring of 2017, we had just gone to bed, sleeping with the open windows. We got settled in bed, and the biggest, loudest, longest, god-awful yell went off just below our house. We jumped out of bed, speaking in low voices, wondering if it could have been a wolf. But nothing in the forest made that sort of noise. It had to be Bigfoot. Whatever it was, it had the lungs of an elephant because the scream it made seemed to go on forever. I swear I felt the RV shake as the creature bellowed out. A minute later, the same type howl came across several canyons near the Clackamas River drainage area. In our heart of hearts, we knew we were squatched. There was no question that Bigfoot was there. We behaved respectfully, and we didn't hunt for it. We went about our daily lives. In June of 2017, we were returning from a long weekend away, winding around the gravel roads with the brights on, and we always looked for deer and other wildlife. On the last stretch of the half-mile road that took us home, we saw the strangest thing. If you've ever seen the movie Predator, you'll get what I mean. From a distance, you could see it moving off the road, but its shape was broken in a strange way. As we got closer to the figure at a normal rate of speed, it bounded onto the road. We could now see its form more clearly. In just three steps, it made it across the road right in front of us. It hesitated just as it touched the opposite side of the road. It turned, but not at the neck. 
It turned at the waist while its left arm was slung back and its right arm was thrust forward. It had stopped to watch us drive by. Its eyes followed us. It was not an inch shorter than eight feet tall, and the chest looked to be four feet wide. Deep red eyes with an orange glow set below a heavy brow just watched us. It turned away from us and was gone like a bird. Our hearts were pounding. I slowed just enough to see the mark in the mud where its foot had gouged out the mud as it climbed the bank into the woods, and the stench left there burned our noses. The next morning, we drove back out to the crossing, which was less than 500 yards away from our front door, and there it was, the slide mark from the toes. It went past the corner of our other neighbor's fence line. We did get photos of the deep impressions in the grass. The stride was several feet between each impression. Not long after our job there was over, it was time to move on. I was going to give the avoided wood knock the night before we left, but darn it, in the busyness of the move, I forgot, so we will never know. Why had I always avoided the wood knock? We didn't want company for dinner. We wanted to live in peace with the natural world around us while we were there. We never once went looking for the Sasquatch inhabiting that area. We believed that the Bigfoot enjoyed our company. Except for the footprints in the teepee nest, we just didn't worry about all the clues there. Even hearing it wasn't proof. That is until we saw it. The point is, is that the clues were there for the longest time. Nine years of them. It took that visual sighting for everything to come together. From that sighting of Bigfoot back to the first odor, it all began to make sense. Sometimes we do the skin pinch test just to remember that it all really happened. Thank you for sharing our story from the Clackamas County Bigfoot Corridor in Oregon. Signed, Margie. This incident occurred in central Pennsylvania in Huntington County back in the early 1970s when I was maybe six or seven years old. My father's family owned a hunting cottage about 40 miles from our home. All the men on my father's side of the family were avid deer hunters. My mother and my grandmother would pick up my sister and I after school on Tuesday before Thanksgiving and we would head to the cottage. We would stop on the way to pick up groceries for the Thanksgiving holiday and for the days that we were to spend at the cottage. My father and all the men would come in later after they got off work. The cottage was located in a remote area in the mountains. We would arrive and unpack the car and get ourselves settled in. We had plenty of space for everyone. My grandfather would bring boxes of apples he got from a few trees in his yard at home. My sister and I would help him cut the apples up in halves and quarters, and we would throw them out in the front yard of the cottage to try to attract deer. After dark, my sister and I would take turns turning on the flashlight to shine it on the front yard where the apples were to see if any deer came to snack on the apples. When deer were seen, everyone would come to the window to see. We would count them, note the sizes, and if there were any bucks in the group. One evening, the adults were having an exciting game of cards. It was my turn to turn on the flashlight to look for deer in the front yard. I turned it on, and I didn't see any deer. I shined the light on the tree, on the ground around it, and on the apples, and I didn't see anything. I leaned into the window, and I shined the flashlight over into the tree line as far as I could. Something caught my eye as I panned the light. I moved the light back to the spot I had passed a second before, and I stopped. I looked, and I looked. Something seemed different. To me, it looked like I was seeing a man standing in the tree line facing me. I could see a body, and I could see a face mixed in with the smaller tree trunks along the edge of the tree line. I was six or seven, and I was too young and dumb to be alarmed. The adults were laughing and playing poker and talking loudly, and I finally casually said, Oh, there's a man down in the yard by the trees. Immediately, all the adult fun stopped. My father, my uncle, and my grandfather all jumped up from the table, and they grabbed their rifles. I was a bit startled by them moving so quickly and all grabbing their guns. 
My dad came to the window beside me to look out, and my mother, my aunt, and my grandmother all hovered around the window trying to see out. My uncle opened the front door and ran into the front balcony, and my grandfather took his rifle and ran to the basement where a door led out into the front yard area. My mother grabbed the flashlight and shined it all over the yard. My father asked me again and again, what did I see? Was I sure that I saw a man? I was scared that I was in some kind of trouble because I'd never expected everyone to bounce to attention like that. I stammered out, I saw him standing right there in the tree line. We had neighbors in the area, but they were a quarter mile away. No sane person would have been roaming through the woods at night with the impending hunting season coming on. A good recipe for getting shot, I'll tell you. Nothing was there as the light shined all over the yard. My grandfather went out into the yard from the basement and looked all around, but he didn't see or hear anything and he finally came back in. They decided that I just saw some tree trunks in the light of the flashlight and it resembled a person. I managed to squeak out in a scared voice that I didn't understand why they all grabbed guns when I just saw a man. My uncle said that no one should be out there in the woods at night sneaking around our cottage. If they were, they didn't have any good intentions. I had never heard any weird sounds or any of my family talking about anything strange in those woods. I don't think I had ever even heard of Bigfoot then. I don't remember anyone ever talking about the incident again after that. They just assumed I somehow made the trees into a shape of a person. It always stuck with me though. I'm now 52 years old. Now that I've read so much about Bigfoot and listened to so many podcasts, I wonder if that's what I saw that night. I will never know for sure. Thank you for reading my story. There's something I need to desperately get off my chest. I'll start by telling you that my name is DJ. I was an outdoorsman until recently. Since I was big enough to hold a rifle, I've spent every spare second of my time in the woods of Northern Ohio. That is, until last year. I no longer hunt, nor do I care to ever be in the woods alone or with anyone for that matter again. I never told anyone my story because at 40 years old, I have spent the better part of my life laughing at and mocking Bigfoot sightings and what I believe to be stories to pass around the campfires to your buddies, never believing for a moment that any truth lie behind any of them, again until last year. I feel like an idiot even telling you this story, this encounter that I've not even mentioned to my wife who is very interested in my newfound passion of tending the garden and staying home with the kids. It was the first day of bow season of 2019. I cannot tell the exact location because the woods are clearly marked no trespassing, and I didn't have permission to be there. The owner of this property lives in Florida, and my father had had permission to hunt it my whole childhood and into my early adult life. But when he passed away in 2014, so did any legal right I most likely had to hunt there. However, I knew no one had ever wandered up on us in all the times we'd hunted opening day for nearly 15 years, and I walked into the woods to one of my father's old stands with the confidence that I was alone. Was I ever so wrong? 2019 was the first year I had been back to this property since my dad had passed away. I knew I didn't have permission to be there, but opening day was something my dad and I shared our whole lives. No matter what was going on in our lives, it was common knowledge that opening day, we would put our differences aside and had sort of a tradition of me picking him up at 4.30 in the morning, stopping by McDonald's to get our coffee, and then silence for the 45 minutes we drove into nothingness until we'd reached this paradise. We'd get out of the truck, grunt in which direction that we would be, and then by noon we were both back at the truck having filled our tags. 
My original plan was to hunt land owned by my brother-in-law only 15 minutes from my house, but I missed my father. I was willing to trespass that day to have a sense of him, to be close to him in a nostalgic way. Now that you know the reason I was there, I don't have a habit of trespassing ever. I reached my father's old stand and started my ascent using the old foot pegs that had been there for years. Halfway up, a peg broke, I slipped down reaching for something to break my fall, and I split my shin. I should have called it a day right there, but I didn't. I cursed my father and I started climbing again. I was after a big buck that he and I had hunted. I hoped the deer was still there. He was a smart one, never coming within range while he watched his siblings go down and be piled into the bed of our truck. I made it to the stand and realized the wood on the part of the stand where you put your feet was rotted, marveling at my father hunting out of this old thing. For Christmas, I had given him a new ladder stand for just this reason. I wanted him to be safe, and after he died, I found them still in their boxes stuffed away in his shed. I began pulling my bow from the ground on the string that had hung from that stand for years and it snapped, sending my bow to the ground, destroying a new five-pin sight I had recently installed. With tears in my eyes, I thought of the missed opportunities to help him put those stands up. I also wouldn't have found myself bleeding into my boot and sitting in a stand that was probably going to kill me. Nevertheless, I limped down and then back up into the stand with my crippled bow. I was discouraged and I should have gone home, but the thought of my father watching me from above gave me a last bit of steam to stay. With the sight broken, I felt less confident, but I was good with a recurve too, and I thought if the shot was close enough, I could make it count. I settled in to watch the sunrise. Within a few minutes, the woods were lit so that I could see. I heard a scream like I had never heard in my life behind me. I heard something thrashing and crashing in the woods a short distance away. Chills ran over my body and hair stood up I didn't know I had. I could see, but there was not enough light yet to make out anything. And then the noise stopped. Fifteen anxious minutes creep by, and to my great surprise, the buck that I wanted stepped into view. Slowly and with great caution, he moved within my bow range. The light was still not good enough to make a sure kill shot, so I sat still and I waited. The buck kept its slow and steady walk and moved right under me. I knew I could take a shot now, so I slowly began to turn my body so that when I stood... I would be in a shooting position. I never took my eyes off the deer. By the time I made my turn, the deer was 10 yards past the tree. I could clearly see a 3-inch round by 3-foot long branch protruding from the deer's side. Intestines were visible and blood poured from the wound. The deer raised its head and looked straight up at me. I froze and assessed the situation. The whole thing was so weird and I was confused, but I didn't want to miss this buck. Patience was my ally. The look in the deer's eyes were screaming for me to end the deer's misery. He wasn't going to stop looking at me, so I began to stand up and to take the shot. My foot broke through a rotten board, sending wood and debris falling to the ground. The deer never blinked. The whole day had been insane. I slowly regained my balance and lifted myself back to a standing position. Once I felt like I wasn't going to crash to the ground, I began to draw my bow. Had the deer lost enough blood that its senses were off? Why was all this happening? Whatever the answers were, I had to take this shot. I squeezed the release and sent the arrow and it hit the target. My shot was a good shot. More crashing behind me. I assumed other deer had bolted when I took that shot, but the deer never jumped. It never ran. It slowly walked 20 yards up a bank and it fell over. I had made my kill and the day was going to wind up being a great memory. I didn't know that the memories of this day would change my life. 
I suddenly felt sick to my stomach. Nausea overwhelmed me, and then a strong, pungent odor surrounded me, and any minute I was going to heave my breakfast over the side. There was more noise and crashing just behind me now. Whatever was making that noise was not a deer. It wasn't fleeing. It was coming to me and was now here. I caught movement under me and I looked down and my life will never be the same. Looking straight up me and smelling the air was a beast. It had to have been eight feet tall and weigh 700 pounds if it was an ounce. It was thick in the shoulders with a head that was so big, and I knew this was no doubt the legend of all the stories I had heard growing up. I was looking at a Bigfoot, and it was looking straight back at me only five feet below. I could see its teeth as it roared, massive three-inch long canines with saliva stringing between its jaws as it opened and closed its mouth. The roar vibrated my internal organs, and it began to reach for me. I had lost all hope, but I think God stepped in at that moment. The deer that I thought was dead, you know, the deer with the log impaled into its side and an arrow that I thought had destroyed its heart, started thrashing in the leaves, drawing the beast's attention away from me. I was more than relieved to see the monster move towards the deer. It quickly leapt onto the deer, killing it instantly. Slinging the deer over its shoulder, it leaped off into the woods and was gone from my view. Shivering and out of breath, I stood in that rotten stand, not believing my luck, when a smaller Bigfoot appeared to my left, coming the way the larger one had come. Its head was held high in the air and trying to catch a scent. Immediately, I knew the beast was smelling blood from the deer and my leg. I sat there motionless and I watched it walk past me. It knew I was there and it watched me as it strolled past. Up the hill and out of view it went, following behind the other. Soon I heard them both chattering to each other much like squirrels do, but obviously much deeper. I figured they were feasting on my monster buck and I was just fine with that. The tearing of the carcass and breaking of bones confirmed that for me. Now was my chance to get out of there, and I jumped to the ground and then sprinted to the truck, and I left. In that old rotten stand full of memories, I left my bow and my love for the outdoors forever. I walked in the kitchen door later that day covered in blood, and I had soiled my pants. I had lost control of my bowels during the ordeal, and I had not realized it until the ride home. My wife was shocked when she saw me, and she asked, where was the deer? I burst out crying and held her for a few minutes before heading to clean up. My wife has never asked me about this again. She knows something bad happened that day, and I wonder if she's afraid to ask. I will eventually tell her the story, but until I do, I will just grow my tomatoes and keep adding on to the kids' swing set. I have told you, however, and the Dixie people. And that's good enough for now. Here are two things that I know for sure. Number one, those monsters speared that big deer with that branch, and they were following up on their kill when they stumbled onto me. And number two, I know they smelled the blood from my wound. I was going to be a meal for them. And I feel lucky the deer was almost dead and was easier prey. It saved my life. I think that'll do it for this podcast. Hope you guys enjoy it. Please share on social media. Give us a thumbs up. Leave us a review. Just simply tell your friends about it. It would really help the podcast. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks. Thanks.